This week, we're playing a little more Evolve before the game launches later this month. We go hands-on with the game's vanguard personal gaming environment, and Johnny Robot heads to the movies to tell us what he thought about Disney's Big Hero 6. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and welcome back to Player Attack for 2015. I hope you had a restful holiday season full of fresh air and family and video games, but now it's back to the tough stuff. More video games. Actually, let's start with something a little less fun than just games, shall we? Gamergate. Many of us were hoping that this social media campaign, which claims to be about ethics in journalism but seems to be anything but, would disappear as soon as the calendar flicked over into a new year, but we were sadly disappointed. Far from disappearing, Gamergate has stepped more into the spotlight. It's now a focus of an upcoming episode of Law and Order SVU. Titled The Intimidation Game and screening later this month, the episode focuses on a female game developer hit by a stream of online insults, intimidation and death threats from the male-dominated gaming community as she prepares to launch her first video game. We're not really expecting SVU to handle the case with much subtlety or affection for gamers. The show instead prefers to insist that violent games lead to violent people and online gaming addiction will lead to your children starving, but it could still be worth watching. Someone who is taking video games seriously is the Korean Esports Association, which was recently successful in getting esports recognised as a second level Olympic sport. No, this doesn't mean we'll be settling in to watch League of Legends, StarCraft or Counter-Strike at next year's games in Rio de Janeiro, but it does put video games into the same category as chess, automobile racing, polo and cheerleading. In other news from the surprising but not really camp, The Elder Scrolls Online is scrapping its monthly subscription requirement. The new edition of the game, subtitled Tamriel Unlimited, is kicking off on March 17, with the console release following on June 9. It's basically the same game we've been playing for a while now, with all of the updates and content editions available straight out of the box, but once you've paid for a copy, you don't have to pay to play. That is, unless you want to. Using a similar approach to Star Wars Online, you can still pay a monthly subscription for a plus option, which gives you a bunch of in-game goodies, including a monthly allowance of crowns to use in the in-game store. In quick news, the team at 343 Industries made the interesting decision to beta test the next content update for Halo the Master Chief Collection, before making the even more interesting decision to scrap that plan. The game's eagerly anticipated online multiplayer component is still broken after its launch late last year, and it seems the developers aren't quite sure how to fix it. A new version of the update is due later this month. Bioshock creator Ken Levine has started hinting at his next game following the closure of Irrational Games 12 months ago. Spoiler, it's not a new Bioshock. Instead, we are promised a small, open-world-ish RPG with quest structure, a sci-fi-ish feel, and definite inspirations from both Stanley Kubrick and Wes Anderson. That said, it's not very far into development, so don't expect any major details anytime soon. Two games have released killer soundtracks over the past week, and if you act fast, you can get both of them for free. After months of fan requests, Bioware has released the Tavern songs from Dragon Age Inquisition as a standalone album, a collection of tunes as performed by the various bards you can encounter throughout the game. As anyone who's played can tell you, these songs are more than just a delightful ambiance. The lyrics offer significant insight into what exactly is going on in the world of the Inquisitor. You can grab this one from the Bioware website or from most major digital platforms, and yes, all the songs are available in both English and Walesian. Riot Games is taking a slightly different approach, releasing Volume 1 of the music of League of Legends, a collection of 15 new and classic tracks from the mobile. I'm less familiar with these tunes, but there is a wide variety of musical genres and emotions covered within the album, and it makes for some great background music. If you're interested, there is also a 46 minute behind the scenes look at how the music was created, available, just like the album, from the League of Legends website. Ridiculously popular Japanese mobile game Puzzle and Dragons is officially coming to new territories and a new platform as Nintendo and Gung Ho Online confirm Puzzle and Dragons Super Mario Bros. Edition, combining everyone's favourite plumber with the addictive Match 3 RPG mechanics of the original. You can expect a Puzzle and Dragons double pack, both the Super Mario Bros. Edition and the RPG spin-off Puzzle and Dragons Z in Europe, North America, Australia, New Zealand and other Western territories sometime in May. 
In some more good news for Aussies, it seems game streaming service Twitch has quietly launched local servers, with gamers already reporting higher bit rates, minimal frame drops, and overall better quality than we could expect from the previously standard Singapore service. And finally this week, Gearbox Entertainment was awfully quiet for months about that Homeworld remastered collection, leading old school strategy fans to wonder just what was going on. Happily, it seems that a lot was going on as the studio announced at PAX South that the bundle, a deliciously high def remastered version of both Homeworld and Homeworld 2, will be released on February 25. Here's what's in store. Mothership is standing by. The collection features both the polished up versions of both games, plus the Sierra originals, with a couple of compatibility tweaks. And while they are single player only, you can get your multiplayer fix from the Home World Remastered Multiplayer Beta, kicking off alongside the single player release later this month. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come. Hello, I am Baymax. After deciding to forge their own identity separate to the animation powerhouse Pixar, it seems Walt Disney Animated Studios just can't get it wrong. First they released Wreck-It Ralph, which was easily the greatest video game movie to date. Next was Frozen, a cultural mega hit that hijacked the very phrase, let it go. That should be a hard act to follow, but not for the big D. Delving into the juicy acquired IP from Marvel, Big Hero 6 is every bit as charming, funny, and genuinely heartwarming as you'd expect. Ow! Story-wise, Big Hero 6 is essentially a superhero movie, and we all know what that means. A derivative, by-the-numbers narrative that we've seen play out a hundred times. Our protagonist is the aptly named Hiro Hamada, a rebellious young robotics genius who'd rather spend his time hustling cash in illegal robot fights than, say, saving the world. This all changes when his older brother Tadashi inspires him to attend a robotics university. Surprise, surprise, Hiro gets in, but the excitement's cut short by family tragedy. Come on, it's an origin story. We all knew this was coming. Hero suspects that it was no accident though, but part of a supervillain's evil plot. Conscripting the aid of the adorable inflatable robot Baymax, Hero soon discovers his speculation was true. Enlisting the help of his fellow genius friends Wasabi, Honey Lemon, Gogo Tamango, and Fred, Hero forms Big Hero 6 to bring the big bad guy to justice. Kick it down! Just punch it! Why is Baymax wearing carbon fiber underpants? This may undermine my non-threatening huggable design. Although the narrative plays out the same old tired, predictable beats, Disney does what it does best and throws a handful of its patented magic dust in your face, causing you to revert back to a being of childlike wonder. This is achieved by the gorgeously creative art direction, which amalgamates the east and west into a beautiful, bright, neon-lit feast for the eyes. Every scene, be it an explosion of action or a quiet moment between a boy and his bot, has something that draws you deeper into the world, and this is no more apparent than with this wonderful cast of characters. I'm fine. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your pain? A zero? Each of the voice actors' performances finds that perfect middle ground between being obnoxious and earnest, truly selling their characters as likeable and, more importantly, relatable people. Full credit to the writing staff, as superhero plots tend to have characters fall into stock roles or become one-dimensional caricatures all too easily, and great effort was put into avoiding that here. 
Each one of the, and I know how sad this is that it still stands out, ethnically diverse squad is capable in their own rights and refreshing to behold. With the cherry on top coming from the wonderfully non-gendered power dynamic, hearing Gogo's battle cry of woman up couldn't help but make me smile. Regardless of their differences, what these characters have in common is equally refreshing to behold. The fact that their heroic abilities and inclusive and positive sensibilities come from an emphasis on education, intelligence, and open-mindedness. That being said, it's a shame we don't get to spend more time viewing the genuinely fun dynamic of Hero and the Gang, as the film suffers from the silent specter of being an establishing film and a possible franchise. Having already hit the 70 minute mark before the central plot is underway, makes the action-packed rush of the finish feel hurried and overall a little too quickly. To me, Big Hero 6 comes from a truly genuine place. It cleverly tackles complex themes and issues, not sugarcoating the sad realities of life and death for its younger audiences, but still manages to be filled with a sense of wonderment, positivity, and most importantly, laughs. The visuals are slick, the action is plentiful and fast-paced, the characters all well-rounded, and the humor always on point. Watch out, Pixar. Disney's climbing your pedestal. <laughs> yeah, fist bump. Fist bump is not in my fighting database. No, this, this isn't a fighting thing. It's what people do sometimes when they're excited or pumped up. Evolve is a 4v1, uh, a a cooperative, competitive multiplayer shooter. It takes place on an alien planet called Sheer, uh, and we have uh, four hunters up against uh, a playable, uh, evolving, powerful monster uh, that, uh, you know, is, is, uh, there's somebody else on the other side. Uh, So it's it's four humans versus one monster. Um, uh, You get to be the boss, you get to be the team uh, that takes down the boss. Uh, you get to be that boss that takes down the team that's trying to trying to hunt you. So it's it's a really uh, uh, unique experience that I don't think uh, uh, many gamers have uh, seen before, and I'm really excited to, to to bring it to market. As a game, Evolve has had a fairly complicated development. Back in 2011, it was picked up by THQ, but by 2012, the publisher had filed for bankruptcy and sold off all of its assets. Publishing rights for the then-unknown game were snapped up by Take-Two Interactive, and everyone promptly forgot about this mysterious co-op multiplayer action game. That is, until Evolve burst onto the scene about 12 months ago and captured our imaginations. Presenting itself as a game for people who want a new first-person shooter, the game's been showing up at gaming events all over the globe, picking up new fans everywhere it goes. We caught up with producer John Block to find out just what those fans have been saying. It's been overwhelmingly positive and, and overwhelming to the point where it's, it's, it's a really crazy experience to have uh, people so passionate and, and, and interested in something that you've spent a lot of time and energy building and creating uh, and, and fine-tuning. It's, uh, it's really humbling and uh, you know, we love our fans and, we, and the response has been, has been really amazing. The first time I played Evolve, it was obvious that this was a game full of potential. Playing as the monster was an incredible feeling of power, while the four humans and their special skills all brought something different and essential to the game. Now that feeling remains, but the game has matured and grown around it. Obviously, there are so many more characters to choose from, three from each class, each with their own unique way of tackling the monsters on Sheer. There are also four different monsters to choose from, and you guessed it, each one of those is different too. Goliath is a brawler that can throw rocks and breathe fire. Kraken flies around the world with electricity-based special attacks. Wraith is a stunning, stealthy monster who can teleport to new locations. And the speedy behemoth cannot jump, but can use its tongue to pull human enemies closer. How am 
much stuff has changed in the past six months for Evolve? Uh, so most of what's changed uh, in the past few months, uh, at least in the content that we've been showing, the content we've been talking about, is uh, balance, bug fixing, tuning. Uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, uh, play testing around the studio, as always. Um, uh, things like these, uh, uh, the big alpha and the, the, the prior alpha that we did a couple months ago. A lot of it is looking at uh, the servers, looking at telemetry, um, you know, looking at large scale playing of the game. We can only do so much when we have our QA going through the game and, and, and testing and finding issues and things like that and trying to make sure that uh, the game is balanced and uh, progression feels good and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So we need to sometimes, uh, you know, have the public help out and uh, give us the numbers that we need and uh, also, you know, it's a great opportunity to get more impressions of the game uh, and get the game in more players' hands, which is always awesome. Obviously, for something so focused on multiplayer, there are a couple of questions that Australian gamers want answered. Firstly, no. There will not be offline multiplayer or LAN play available. You will be able to play in single player offline mode, but for everything else, you will need to have an internet connection. There is a compromise though. If you want to play a match with four other friends, you will be able to join a private server and play against each other, which means that nobody else has to get involved. The second question, and this is the big one, has a more positive answer. Yes, there will be dedicated servers for Evolve located in Australia. The game will automatically find the best, closest server for you when you jump into matchmaking, so for gamers down under, you'll be playing on machines based right here. There is also a backup system in place, which will see the game click over to peer-to-peer -to -peer if there are any server dramas, but most of the time you will be playing on dedicated local machines. The, the first time you go into uh, the game in, uh, in, a, in a multiplayer setting, we uh, give you a, uh, a, the option to set the preference that you have for matchmaking. So you get to set, oh, I want to be the monster, I want to be the trapper, and we try uh, our hardest to make sure that when we matchmake you, we, we match you into scenarios where you get to be what you want to be. Uh, obviously, that sort of thing is not always going to happen, uh, but so, so we try to uh, have you order your preference, uh, you know, uh, in first to, to fifth, and we try our best to make sure that happens. And you can change that at any time. If you suddenly decide you want to, you, you prefer being the trapper to being assault, you can change that at any time. But we always want to make sure that uh, that you're able to play what you want to play when you want to play it. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it, you know, it's, it's all about the player choice and giving people the option. Another really nice recent addition to Evolve is a sort of story mode, something we didn't expect from an asymmetrical multiplayer game. At launch, you'll be given the option to jump into a single match quick play mode, which throws you into one map as a standalone experience. Alternatively, you can select evacuation mode, which strings five matches together as the hunters fight their way to an evacuation point. At the end of each round, the winning sign gains a nifty perk to take into the next. The monster might get an AI minion to run around the new map, or a bunch of armoured turrets will pop up to help out the hunters. This isn't a set playlist either. As you play through, you can vote on the next map and gameplay mode, so no two games of evacuation will be the same. So the game, game has been going well, everyone's been loving it. Are, are you still in love with this game? I know you loved it in February, are you sick of it yet? Do you just want, do you, do you just want to just get rid of it now? Uh, no, no. I've been I've been working on this game for four years, um, and I still love it. Um, it's there's just something about it that uh, it just it, it, it keeps your interest. Um, there's endless replayability, um, and I I hope that uh, you know everyone out in the public when when we make it available in February grabs it and plays it for for just as many years as I've been working on it and uh, just and just that many years uh, more on top of that. We are happy to report that after a slight delay late last year, Evolve is out this month, February 10, for Xbox One, PlayStation 4 and Windows PC. Over the player attack summer break, we wanted to spend some time enjoying the glorious Australian weather, but we didn't want to miss out on those precious gaming hours. Happily, we didn't have to choose. The guys at Blue Mouth Interactive sent us over this Games Vanguard Black Edition, so we were able to lug a console around with us on the go. This calls itself a personal gaming environment. Basically, it's a sort of console laptop. The rugged, sturdy case also features a built-in 19-inch monitor, as well as all the space needed to plug in any button console with HDMI output.
That means Xbox 360, Xbox One, PS3 or PS4, they'll all fit in this thing securely and you'll be able to play to your heart's content. In terms of sound, we were pleasantly surprised by the audio this thing can pump out. Sure, it's coming out of some tiny speakers, so there's some inevitable tinniness, but less than we'd expected. There's some decent bass here as well, and the volume can get pretty loud while remaining happily undistorted. As a typically Australian test, we took ours down the local pub to see how it would hold up against tipsy conversations in the video jukebox, and we had no problems hearing audio cues and playing games. We were asked a lot of curious questions, of course. If you'd prefer to bring your own sound system, the Vanguard also comes with two headphone jacks, one for player one and one for player two, so you can do away entirely with the built-in speakers. The video quality on the 19-inch matte monitor is also excellent, crisp and clear, and while it's quite a lot smaller than most living room TVs, that's not an issue if you just play a little closer to the screen. Do remember, this is not 100% portable. You will still need a PowerPoint. Two, actually, because you'll need to plug in both the built-in monitor and your console. This strikes us as a slightly awkward design choice. Giving the monitor cable a piggyback plug would mean that avid gamers wouldn't need to search around for a double adapter or hope that their travelling location includes somewhere with two outlets. That said, it's not really been designed for gaming on the go, because that's what we've got handhelds and tablets for. The Vanguard is pretty slick, really. The outside is a nice matte black, and it's not immediately obvious that it contains a gaming console, even though there is a massive GAMES logo on the outside. The inside could afford to be a little bigger. We found it pretty cramped with an Xbox One, a power pack, two controllers, and an assortment of cables, but it's already getting pretty heavy. The official games documentation says that the Vanguard weighs in at just over 5 kilos, including that 19-inch screen. That might not sound like too much, but once you add a console and all the accessories, it stacks up pretty quick. Even with the included shoulder strap, we wouldn't like to be lugging this one around too much, but it is more than suited to short trips or just being thrown gently in the back of a car. If you travel a lot like we do, something like the Vanguard is ideal. Lugging a console around for a bit of holiday gaming is always fun, but always a little risky. It's not even the potential for damage that's the problem, but the potential that you might not be able to use the thing at the other end. Many hotels refuse to let guests use the HDMI inputs on their in-room televisions, so your beloved PlayStation becomes just another piece of useless heavy furniture while you're away. The Vanguard, with its built-in monitor, gets rid of that risk and protects your machine at the same time. Games says that even though the Vanguard could probably withstand being chucked underneath a plane, the case has been designed to be put into the overhead luggage compartment on most airlines. If you travel a lot, that is obviously an important factor, but be warned, we have also heard reports of Vanguard cases, particularly the side clasps, breaking during long-haul flights, so be careful if that's something you're considering. Attaching luggage locks may help, but the clasps never really sit flush with the case, so they're always going to be a weak point. It's also worth noting that we had a little trouble getting ours to line up properly and lock securely, and sometimes when carrying the case by the handle, it would pop awkwardly out of line. The console was still firmly strapped inside and there was no risk of it falling out, but the flex of the plastic was a little worrying. Other than that, we didn't have many problems with the Vanguard over the hours we spent with it. Minor complaints about weight are unavoidable. It is a little bit too heavy for me to carry for too long, but that's a personal thing. The Vanguard is the newest personal gaming environment from games, and there are clear improvements that have been made since the previous generation, the Sentry, which came with a 15-inch monitor. We're hoping that the company can look at the few issues that remain with the Vanguard and incorporate fixes into the next model, with better clasps being the top of the wish list. That said, if you travel a lot or simply don't want to feel chained to one particular spot for your gaming, the Vanguard is something you should definitely look into. It's not cheap, but who can put a price on portable gaming? And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, Johnny Robot sits down with CD Projekt Red to chat about The Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt, while we get up close and personal with both Hatsune Miku Project Diva F2 and brand new Xbox One indie release iDarb, which is out now and absolutely free for the month of February. In the meantime, you can catch us on playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack. <laughs>